unenforceable. But after saying this, let me say another thing which gives the other side, and that is that although it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, behavior can be regulated. Even though it may be true that the law cannot change the heart, it can restrain the heartless. Even though it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, it can restrain him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. And so while the law may not change the hearts of men, it can and it does change the habits of men. And when you begin to change the habits of men, pretty soon the attitudes will be changed, pretty soon the hearts will be changed. I'm convinced that we still need strong civil rights legislation. And there's a bill before Congress right now to have a national a federal open housing bill, a federal law declaring discrimination in housing unconstitutional, and also a bill to make the administration of justice real all over our country. Now, nobody can doubt the need for this. Nobody can doubt the need if he thinks about the fact that since 1963, some 58 Negroes and white civil rights workers have been brutally murdered in the state of Mississippi alone. Not a single person has been convicted for these dastardly crimes. There have been some indictments, but no one has been convicted. So there is a need for the whole question of the administration of justice. There is a need for fair housing laws all over our country. And it is tragic indeed that Congress last year allowed this bill to die. And that bill died in Congress. A bit of democracy died. A bit of our commitment to justice died. And if it happens again in this section, session of Congress, greater degree of our commitment to democratic principles will die. And I can see no d more dangerous trend in our country than the constant developing of predominantly Negro central cities ringed by white suburbs. This is only inviting social disaster. And the only way this problem will be solved is by the nation taking a strong stand and by state governments taking a strong stand against housing segregation and against discrimination in all of these areas. Now there's another thing that I'd like to mention as I talk about the Massive Action Program and time will not permit me to go into specific programmatic action to any great degree. But it must be realized now that the Negro cannot solve the problem by himself. And there again, there are those who always say to Negroes, why don't you do something for yourself? Why don't you lift yourselves by your own bootstrap? And we hear this over and over again. Now certainly, there are many things that we must do for ourselves and that only we can do for ourselves. Certainly we must develop within a sense of dignity and self-respect that nobody else can give us. A sense of manhood, a sense of personhood. A sense of not be, being ashamed of our heritage, not being ashamed of our color. It was wrong and tragic that the Negro ever allowed himself to be ashamed of the fact that he was black, or ashamed of the fact that his home, ancestral home, was Africa. And so there's a great deal that the Negro can do to develop self-respect. There's a great deal that the Negro must do and can do to amass political and economic power within his own community and by using his own resources. And so we must do certain things for ourselves, but this must not negate the fact and cause the nation to overlook the fact that the Negro cannot solve the problem him himself. A man was on the plane with me some weeks ago, and he came and talked with me, and he said, uh, 
problem, Dr. King, that I see with what you all are doing is that every time I see you and other Negroes, you are protesting, and you aren't, you aren't doing anything for yourself. And he went on to tell me that he was very poor at one time, and he was able to make it by doing something for himself. Why don't you teach your people, he said, to live themselves by their own bootstraps. And then he went on to say other groups uh, face disadvantages, the Irish, the Italians, and he went down the line. And I said to him that it does not help the Negro. It only deepens his frustration for unfeeling and sensitive people to say to him, that other ethnic groups who migrated or were immigrants to this country just a hundred years ago or so have gotten beyond him and he came here some 344 years ago. And I went on to remind him that the Negro came to this country involuntarily in chains while others came voluntarily. I went on to remind him that no other racial group has been a slave on American soil. I went on to remind him that the other problem that we have faced over the years is that the society placed a stigma on the, the color of the Negro, on the color of his skin, because he was black. Doors were closed to him that were not closed to other groups. And I'm to say to people, that you ought to lift yourself by your own bootstraps. But it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And the fact is that millions of Negroes, as a result of centuries of denial and neglect, have been left bootless. And they find themselves impoverished aliens in this affluent society. And that is a great deal that the society can and must do if the Negro is to gain the economic security that he needs. Now, one of the answers, it seems to me, is a guaranteed uh, annual income, a guaranteed minimum income for all people and for all families of our country. It seems to me... It seems to me that the civil rights movement must now begin to organize for the guaranteed annual income, begin to organize people all over our country and mobilize forces so that we can bring to the attention of our nation this need and this something which I believe will go a long, long way toward dealing with the Negro's economic problem and the economic problem with many other poor people confronting our nation. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk about Vietnam, but I can't make a speech without mentioning some of the problems that we face there, because... <laughs> because I think this war has diverted attention from civil rights, it has strengthened the forces of reaction in our country and has brought to the forefront the military-industrial complex that even President Eisenhower warned us against at one time. And above all, it is destroying human lives. It's destroying the lives of thousands of the young, promising men of our nation. Destroying the lives of little boys and little girls in Vietnam. But one of the greatest things that this war is doing to us in civil rights is that it is allowing the great society to be shot down on the battlefields of Vietnam every day. And I submit this afternoon that we can end poverty in the United States. Our nation has the resources to do it. The national gross product of America will rise to the astounding figure of some $800 this year. We have the resources. The question is whether the nation has the will. And I submit that if we can spend $5 billion a year to fight an ill-considered war in Vietnam and $20 billion to put a man on the moon, our nation can spend billions of dollars and on their own two feet right here on Earth. <laughs>